parallel processing in this kind of audio mixing is essentially when you have multiple routed outputs of your source sound and you're processing each one of them in different ways. So for one, we're going to do a little sizzle effect, for one, we're going to do a phasing effect, and one, we're going to do a low-end management effect. This isn't so different than having a wet-dry knob on an individual plugin, uh, but when you set it up this way, you still have your main source audio, and then we're mixing in, to various degrees, all these additional new effects as if they're their own individual plugin, but they're on different tracks. So we have complete control over them and we can do all sorts of fun things with them. And so you can see each one of these has its own volume level set independent of the main track, which is set at zero. Um, so the first one of these parallel processing effects that we're going to look at is the sizzle sound. And this is going back to that kind of crunchy spread in the, the stereo image sizzle. I'm taking that, that effect that we've built in the original bass source patch and amplifying it to a really interesting, sizzly, ear candy, ear tickling kind of effect. So let's take a listen to that on and off. So you can hear it's got like a, a little bit more of a brittle, a little, like a lot more air in it. It's got um, a, like a high-end sizzle, basically. That's why it's called crunch sizzle. If we want to hear what this parallel processing track sounds like on its own, we just turn on, we change the routing from the original to be sends only so that we're not hearing any of the original source. We're only hearing what's going through this additional parallel processing channel. So you can hear there's almost no low end. It's just in the, the upper and high range, and it's very sharp, it's very crunchy, and it's very spread in the stereo. So going into the individual components of the crunch sizzle track, the first thing we're starting with is NLS. It's not as severe as before, but I've added a little bit of drive, and I've added just a, a tiny bit of gain. Next thing I have is the F6. So this is before and after with the F6. So I'm essentially using the F6 for a very simple thing here, which is basically just to roll off everything before about uh, 1,000 hertz. And we're just focusing now on the high and upper, mid-range and high. So that essentially just takes the, the top part of the audio and allows us to then process that further. Next plugin we have up in the chain is the Aphex Vintage Exciter. It is very easy to overuse and very easy to go too far with, but if you're just looking to make something stand out in a mix or just cut through, this is almost always the first place I stop, especially with synth, because it just finds a way to harmonically excite your signal in a pleasing way that'll just cut through a mix and, and make everything sound just nice and sharp. All right, so the next thing up we have is Meta filter, which allows you to create a filter like you'd have on a, on a synth, uh, high pass, low pass, band pass, notch, and automate it in a couple of really interesting ways. You can either use LFO, an envelope follower, or a sequencer down here to do all sorts of different things, or you can use combinations of them that uh, interact in interesting ways depending on how you've set the, uh, the sliders in this little section here. Um, so let's take a listen to before and after of what it's doing. A subtle effect in the way that I'm using it, uh, that is one of the themes of the way that I'm using all these plugins. I'm creating a not so subtle effect using a lot of individual subtle pieces, but let's take a look at what it's doing exactly. You can kind of see right here in this cool little window that they've built to give you a sense of what's happening. Uh, I've put on a high pass filter that cuts off all the low with this curve and a little bit of resonance popping up there. I have it on an LFO sine wave uh, at a pretty low rate, so it's just kind of easily going up and down, just cutting off the low end with a little bit of resonance at the central frequency. It's using both the LFO and the envelope follower to create that shape. So the envelope follower uh, will react to the amplitude and the power of the sound, and the LFO will just be going up and down on this kind of easy sine wave curve. So again, we're creating a little bit more of that abstract, humanized, te unexpected texture. Uh, and that's just adding a little bit more movement to that crunch sound. So the next thing we have in the parallel processing is the phase, which is labeled here as synth phase. This doesn't have a whole lot on it, but it's adding a big element to the sound. Let's take a listen before and after. This is before. And this is after. 
So there's a big phase effect in there. That's again, continuing that additional abnormal humanized but unexpected movement to the sound. And that just keeps everything flowing and sounding less rigid than a soft synth might sound. Actually, let's take a listen to just the synth phase on its own without the crunch sizzle layer or the original source sound. So this is just the synth phase parallel processing layer on its own. And you can really hear that it is just purely a phase effect uh, with very little other uh, elements to it that is then blended back into the original source audio. On this synth phase track, we have three plugins. We have NLS, we have Enigma, and we have F6. Let's see what the NLS is doing. NLS in this case is not doing a whole lot. In fact, I don't think it's doing anything. I think I just have it here in case I want to be able to control the gain staging uh, later on in the process. And a lot of my mixes, I'll just throw NLS on right at the beginning and not even touch them. They're just there if I need them, and oftentimes I will need them, but sometimes I don't. And this is a case where uh, I didn't go back and use it here. And then the next thing is Enigma. So let's, let's listen to Enigma before and after. So you can hear Enigma is really where all of that phasey sound is coming from. I've used this off and on for years and years and years. There are some presets in here that, going back to my very earliest days of sound design, I would delight in checking out Hallucinous Bread, Mushroom Therapy, Wind Chimes, Glass Echoes, Metal Ringer. These are all over the early sound design jobs that I used to do. Uh, the Roost for Ty West, Trigger Man, I Can See You. I would get so much use out of this stuff because you can really transform the way that, uh, that a sound uh, comes across. This is a, a really cool, creative, psychedelic plugin, uh, and you get some really awesome stuff from it. In this case, we're not doing anything super crazy with it. We're just basically adding a phase effect, but I like this particular plugin as opposed to just a, uh, straight, a more straightforward uh, phase plugin because it adds kind of a unique, specific sound that I haven't really heard in other phase plugins, which is really useful for doing uh, score or horror or tense scenes where you know something bad is going to happen. You're constantly set on edge when you hear the frequencies just kind of moving up and then falling and then rising and falling. And Enigma is really, really wonderful for creating that kind of effect. So then the last plugin that we have on the phase channel is F6. And F6 in this case is just doing a little bit of manipulation to get the sound exactly where I wanted it to go. This is a before and after. So not a huge difference, but the main thing that I'm doing here is I'm cutting off all the low end because I just don't want any errant low end boominess. And then I'm using a, uh, a shelf to just kind of find the right shape for the audio in here. And then just to give you a sense again of what this sounds like on its own and then mixed in. This is the original source with the crunch sizzle. So now when you hear it again, it's kind of flat and monotonous, but you add in the synth phase layer. And it's got a movement to it and it has that rising up and down so that not every hit is the exact same thing. And the last piece of parallel processing that we have is what I've labeled here low blow, which is the low end management of this synthesizer sound. And since this is a giant, all encompassing, booming, massive destruction sound, I wanted complete control over the low end. So I've processed it out to its own parallel path here, low blow. Let's take a listen to before, after, and isolated so you can get a sense of exactly what's going to that channel. This is the original crunch and synth, but no low end. This is with the low end added. So you can see that adds a lot of low end. And then let's take a listen to it just on its own. So this is just the low end parallel processing on its own. So what I've done uh, essentially is amplify and boost the low end signals that I like, the specific frequencies that I like, made them a little bit punchier, they hit a little bit harder, and because I've done it in its own clean, separated way, I've been able to just, just affect those and not all the other frequencies that are present in, uh, in the rest of the uh, template that we've adjusted so far. In this parallel pathway, we have three plugins. It's a pretty simple one. 
NLS again, RBase, and F6. NLS, again here, not doing a whole lot, but I have boosted the gain just slightly, 2.5 dB in the output. Next we have RBase. This is doing most of the work in this case. Let's hear before and after. So you can hear that is adding a massive amount of very concentrated, very dense, very hard and punchy bass. Our bass is really one of the best bass enhancement plugins I've ever worked with. What it does is you center it on a frequency that you want to enhance. You move the intensity slider up and down. It's very simple. So let's take a listen to it while I move this. I've, I've pushed the intensity up to 10.4. Uh, let's take a listen to the sound as I move the frequency uh, up and down, and you can hear how the sound changes. So you can hear that up by 256, we're getting a little bit past the part of the low end that is very pleasing. And down here in the, the 32 hertz range, we're just too far below the low end that's hitting that kind of hard punch. Right around here, right around 87, it's enhancing the frequencies in the original signal that are responsible for that big punchy boom. That sounds really nice to me now. So the last one we have here is F6. Now you can see here in F6, I've done kind of the opposite of what I did in the crunch sizzle track. I've rolled off the high end and essentially used it as like a low pass filter because this is just essentially a track that is meant to affect the low end and I just don't want any of these high end frequencies that are being affected by the plugin to mix and intermingle with the other pass that we've set up. So to keep it clean, I've rolled it off relatively high, around 1K to 2K because there's some pleasing things happening in here. But you can see when you watch it, this band that I've set, number four, around 400 hertz, That's bouncing up and down, so that is the dynamic EQ part of the F6 plugin, which you can set down here in the controls, and you can, if you have a frequency that you don't want to completely notch out, you don't want to completely get rid of, but will sometimes be a little too boomy, especially on a sustained signal, like a big, long bass hit, sometimes those boomy, sustained frequencies can be really irritating. They just, they muddy up the mix and they muddy up the sound. So you set a threshold level that allows you to bring it down once it crosses a certain threshold. Um, and that adds its own kind of pleasing uh, audio quality. So you can see that's really helped focus the sound down to these low-end frequencies, but still allows some of the frequencies between 250 and 500 to come through, but not be too present and too overpowering. So we have our main source audio. We've added a crunch sizzle on the sides of the stereo image, very high-end crunch sizzle, a phase sound that gives it movement, and then a low-end sound that gives it power and punch and depth. But that's not quite the whole thing yet. That's not quite where I want it to end up. So I've taken all of these different parallel processing tracks and I'm running them through a group bus, which I have here, the Synth Destruct. And I have a number of different plugins down here, not all of which I'm using, but I have a couple that are options. And this is the final stage of the audio destruction template that I've created. And let's take a listen to it before and after so you can see what it's doing. And this is a stage where I've taken what's essentially a fairly distorted but clean sounding signal and I've added a sense of chaotic breakup, as if it's running through a super hot tape or it's running through bad speakers. And this is where it kind of adds this element of mystery and um, strangeness and otherness that is unpredictable for the listener and really um, kind of sets people's ears on edge in a, a really pleasing and tweaking way. A way that I like to explore in a lot of the sound design that I do, and especially in a, a, a show like Dead Wax, getting it to this place where it sounds unexpected and original and unique is really important. Let's take a look at the elements that uh, we're using here to do that. So the first thing we have again is NLS channel, which is the beginning of all tracks. And we can see that this one has the gain jacked way up to about 10. The drive pushed up a little bit. This is where it's really fun to use this mic preamp. Let's take a listen to what it sounds like with the mic preamp turned on. I 
that's a really harsh, dirty, angry version of the sound, which was already pretty harsh and dirty and angry. But one of the things that you do in film scoring and film sound design is you need an arc and a movement to the type of sounds that you're creating. So there's versions in the, in the film where I'm using it without the mic preamp turned on, and there's versions where I've turned the mic preamp on just to give it that extra emphasis and edge and that sound of breakup and distortion and decay, which is really what this whole uh, template's all about. So I highly recommend messing around with the, uh, the mic preamp button here, which is a really fun one. The next thing we're doing, we are working with the one knob louder. This is a super simple plugin. It works kind of like a maximizer or a limiter and just makes everything really fat and present and in your face. Next part of this plugin string out is we're gonna crush that down a little bit. So this is just something to help it be boosted up as far as it can go. The next one that it is going through is the R-verb stereo again. And this is adding another element of reverb onto everything now that it's gone through all these different parallel pathway processing tracks. And you can see it's just adding a tiny little bit. It's only at 6% in the wet dry and it's cut pretty low. It's just adding the upper mid range. And it's just adding a little bit of depth to the sound. Let's hear before and after. So very subtle, but it's adding a little bit of glue reverb decay on top of everything else. So instead of just having reverb on the source base, now the crunch sizzle, the synth phase, and the low blow are all getting just a little bit of extra reverb decay to kind of seal it all together. And the last thing we're using in this plug-in string, well, actually you can see I had TG12345 here as well, but I opted in this case to use the L1 limiter. So let's take a listen to what it's doing before and after. So that L1 limiter, has really brought a very, very hot signal way back down to manageable territory, and in doing so, has created this kind of audible artifacting quality, which was really something that limiters aren't necessarily meant for, but you can uh, you can work with when you're trying to create this kind of humanized, abstracted, uh, unexpected sound. I'm listening to it again before and after. You can hear a little bit of warble on that decay. It goes wah, 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 down as it decays. But then when you turn the L1 limiter on and you really you bring the threshold way down and the out ceiling way down. In that long decay, that wah, wah, wah turns into like a harsh, buzzy breakup sound. It goes It sounds like the actual electricity running through the wires or having a heat effect on the sound. And that's what I really like. That's what like is kind of at the heart of this whole template, is running a very, very hot signal through a limiter like this and just hearing and playing around with and experimenting with how it breaks up and how it crushes the sound. So just for comparison, let's hear the master bus without any of this stuff. That long decaying warble almost sounds like an echo because it kind of like, it has these little dips and rises in the volume. So the last piece of this template, which is not something I used in the final version of this sound, but I used all throughout the show Deadwax, is the Abbey Road Vinyl plugin. This is a plugin that I became aware of right as I was pitching the show Deadwax. Because I knew I was making a show about vinyl, I was super excited because this plugin allows you to get into incredible detail with how you are trying to emulate the sound of a vinyl record. There are a ton of different options and a ton of different ways that you can take an original source of recording and make it sound like it's coming from a record. It could be a very clean new record or it could be a dirty old record. You can also mess with the type of needle and cartridge and the type of table that you're working with. There's all sorts of options. I didn't end up using it here because I think I was already satisfied with where everything had gotten, but let's use the sound as a test to see what we can do with the Abbey Road vinyl plugin. You can crank the input and drive, lower the output, So cranking the input and drive allows you to overmodulate the sound in a, a way that's really unique to a hot pressed record. And you also have wow and flutter controls, which again, I like to set 
the rate pretty low and the depth kind of medium high so that you could kind of have a long, slow, tonal warble. One of my favorite things about the Every Road Vinyl plugin is the tone arm position. You can use this knob here to change the tone arm position. And as most vinyl collectors know, the sound of a record at the outer edge can be wildly different than the sound of a record at the inner edge. And there are a couple different cartridges you can use, moving magnet, magnetic coil, DJ. And each of those has their own unique, specific sound in the way they pick up the, the audio that's on the grooves. You can also change your turntable style, and you can also work with a print or a lacquer, so finalizing or lathe cutting. You can add noise, crackle, and clicks and change the density of all of that as well. And there are a couple other great features here too, like phase distortion and a modulator that allows some of that nice humanization. And this is, for Dead Wax, an indispensable tool to make source audio sound like it's coming from a record. We had a lot of uh, pieces of audio that were uh, featured in the show that needed to sound like they were coming from records, uh, but I only had digital copies of. So running it through this and playing with all of these different features allowed me to very, very accurately emulate what it would sound like if it had been pressed to a record and then recorded.